So the Red Angel of the World Eaters is here, let's talk about the strengths and weaknesses of Demon Primarch Angron, and exactly what he can do in-game. Hello and welcome back to All Specs Tactics, where today I thought we'd do a focused review of Demon Primarch Angron, look over all of his rules from the new Codex World Eaters, see how much damage he can do and how tough he is compared with other things, all the different ways that you can give him some buffs in the Codex, and some overall thoughts for using him in-game. Just quickly, while we're on the subject of Angron himself, I thought I'd just quickly mention the channel's March giveaway, as this will be for one of five copies of Demon Primarch Angron, and as per normal for giveaways on the channel, there's two different ways to enter. You can either support the channel on the Patreon page for any amount, that gets you automatic entry into the big giveaways each month, and there'll be plenty more coming, or you can support via social media completely for free. To do that, you subscribe to the YouTube channel, like the Facebook page, and then to actually enter the draw, a giveaway post appears on the 1st of March. Reply to that post with a photo of any 40k miniature with your name and the date handwritten within the photo, the last bit just to stop Facebook bots and spammers. I then put all the entries from Patreon or Facebook into a random number generator, pick out 5 winners, and the results will be announced on the channel update video on the 4th of the month, and I'll post out the Demon Primark to the lucky winners. There's further similar giveaways every single month, so feel free to check out the Facebook page or the Patreon page, they're both links down in the video description. In any case though, let's jump into the rules, and Angron really is quite an exciting model for the World Eaters, a Primarch Reborn, and I suspect he's going to be a fairly popular miniature from Games Workshop. In-game he's confirmed to be a 360 point Lord of War choice now, and he's got most of the keywords that you'd expect, Demon Character, Monster and Fly. It's not Titanic, the same as the other Demon Primarchs, which does mean that he won't be generating extra Blood Tithe points for dying that way. But one interesting keyword that he does pick up is the Warp Locus one, which means you could potentially be throwing down units of blood letters very close to the enemy. Statline wise he is fairly monstrous, he moves 16 inches and hits on 2s, his strength 9, toughness 7, 18 wounds and 12 attacks, leadership 10 with a 2 plus save and a 4 plus invul. Toughness wise I'd say is okay, we'll get onto his durability a bit in a minute, though maybe not the raw amount of tankiness of his brother Primarchs who both have minus 1 damage and potentially more. He is significantly cheaper though at 360 points, plus he does have his respawning trick which is pretty brutal. Obviously combat's what he's all about, in melee he does look to be one of the strongest melee combatants in all of Warhammer 40k, as you'd probably expect. His demon weapons are Samniarius and Spine Grinder, you can either choose to either sweep or slash with them. The sweep gives you triple attacks at strength user, AP3 and damage 1. Usually with the World Eater's Relentless Rage Legion traits, that's going to be Strength 10, AP-3 and Damage 1 across 39 attacks, which is pretty mad. Or you can choose to Slash for the 13 attacks, usually that's going to be Strength 15, AP-4 and a Damage D3 plus 3. Utterly brutal, and we'll talk about how many models that lightly kills in a second. As a Demon Primarch though, he does get a bunch of special rules. He gets the Relentless Rage rule, which is the new incarnation of the World Eater's Legion trait, plus 1 strength and plus 1 attack on the charge, and access to the blood tithe for all the nastiness that that brings. He's then got 3 other special rules, Champion of the Arena is the one where he gets to select a single core or character unit to reroll all hits, pretty brutal if you've got a big unit of core world eaters, though I feel like he's often going to be most used just using that on himself. He's then got a Wrathful Presence rule, which is an interesting one that you choose one of in your command phase, this either gives you the choice of an aura of plus 1 attack to nearby core units, Handy enough if he's in the thick of the fighting, but I feel like with that massive movement, he's usually going to outpace the other World Eaters. There's one for reroll ones to his in melee for all other World Eaters units, so that's not him. The reason that that's interesting is that it can affect non-core units, so it could be used on things like Demon Engines or Exalted 8 Bound or characters. But the last one I think is by far the most interesting, a 6 inch aura of no falling back for either yourself or your enemy. I'd say that, that one's by far the biggest deal, maybe if Angron charges something and then maybe doesn't quite kill it, or charges something and consolidates into something else, and the enemy can't get away from him, and he likely gets to kill another enemy unit in their turn, unless they can slay him in melee themselves. If you do have a way to make that one useful, that's probably the best, the other two I guess are okay if you've got other world eaters nearby. Then if he's in the army, he must be the warlord, which actually I would argue is probably a negative, as his warlord trait is a bit worse than Lord Invocatus's, which is significantly good with some pre-game moves. Angron's warlord trait gives him a 6 inch aura of cancelling enemy objective secures, which sounds very good on paper, and it would be I think on most other units, but I kind of feel like on Angron it's a little bit wasted potential. 
Often I think he's going to be fighting on his own because he moves so much faster than your other units, so he's not likely to be supported by other objective secured units of yours. But even if that rule triggers and say he debuffs an objective secured troops choice, he still might not hold that objective if they have more than one model on it, as he still only counts as one model himself. In general this would be a good warlord trait if you could put it on more buffing characters I think, but on Angron it's not really all that great, not for the way that you're likely wanting to throw him repeatedly at the enemy and just deal mass damage, unsupported from other world eaters. Overall though, he's big, strong, relatively tough and has that annoying blood tide respawn mechanic. Overall I feel like he is a unit that people are going to enjoy putting on the table, does enough damage to live up to his name, though does have a few issues such as being able to be targeted behind obscuring terrain and his warlord traits are touch suboptimal. Generally speaking though, his damage output is truly monstrous. As mentioned with Relentless Rage, with the strike you get 13 attacks at strength 15, AP minus 4 and damage D3 plus 3, or 39 attacks with a sweep at strength 10, AP 3 and damage 1. I'd say the default thing would be to have him re-rolling his own hit rolls, unless you've got a very big World Eaters combat unit to buff nearby him, and if you add the re-roll ones to hits from Champion of the Arena, then he's averaging around about 30 dead guardsmen, 13 dead space marines, around 5 dead terminators with storm shields, where interestingly both of the profiles are pretty much even against them, a kind of hilarious 52 wounds against a standard toughness 7 vehicle, so that probably means that any one rhino is going bye bye, and then a big 22 wounds against a hard target like a toughness 8 vehicle with a 5 plus invul and minus 1 damage. Certainly against the vast majority of targets in the game he isn't really going to struggle, Hopefully each time he charges it will lead to one dead unit unless they've got abnormal durability for one reason or another. I think if you are trying to charge him it'd be pretty ideal to try and get the charge off on two different units and divide his attacks between them, though there are a few units that will cause him problems. I'd say the biggest things he's going to have issues with is anything with transhuman physiology on models with two or three wounds, say for example Deathwing Terminators, if you're wounding them on fours and then they're saving with a four plus invul you're only killing around about three of them, which isn't as much as you'd probably like. His other big weakness are any units with damage caps, which are kind of brutal against his weapons that don't have any sort of rule to defeat that. It does mean that if you're charging something like Abaddon or Catan Shard, you're only going to be taking off three wounds against them, and that does feel a bit sad for Korn's Rage personified. Generally speaking, usually going to be worth avoiding those kind of things, but against the vast majority of the opponent's army, he's just going to kill unit after unit. In general though, his melee damage is rather good, durability though it's a little bit more questionable. He does have 18 wounds, toughness 7, a 2 plus save and a 4 plus invul, and these are the rough amounts of damage that you'd have to hit Angron with if you wanted to kill him. You need a pretty whopping 162 bolt rifle hits at strength 4 AP minus 1, generally speaking they're going to struggle a bit with toughness 7 and a 2 plus save. You need 81 hits out of heavy bolters, but things like overcharged plasma, last cannons and melters that are within close range are going to be quite efficient into him. He only takes 15 last cannon hits to bring down, or 10 hits with melter within half range. Overall, I'd rate his toughness as solid enough but not standout. Compared with, say, an Imperial Guard Lehman Russ with their toughness 8 and 2 plus save, it's generally a little bit less durable than them per point against things like plasma, last cannons or melters, around about 20% less durable than the tanks. He is likely to be right at the forefront of the army as well, so unless you can lock the opponent's units in combat and stop him being shot, I'd say he typically isn't usually likely to survive an entire turn of the enemy army doing focused damage daily on him to try and get him out of their way. Also doesn't help that he's 18 wounds and can't hide behind the obscuring terrain rule. He'll be a lot better on any battlefields that have actual really big true line of sight blocking terrain like L-shaped ruins and things in tournaments, but not so great if there's a whole bunch of ruins with windows. Admittedly though, he does have his blood tithe ability to respawn and he might be able to hide in melee, so the durability in some cases might be kind of moot. On his raw stats though, he isn't enormously tough for the cost. Talking of respawning and things though, let's talk about the other ways that we can get more out of Angron on the table. And you do that with the blood tithe. A few different abilities can be really good use to him, but obviously the big one for him is 6 blood tithe points to respawn him. You can put him back into reserve for the warp strike special rule at the end of any phase, and then he pops up somewhere that's greater than 9 inches away from any enemy units, 8 wounds remaining, and presumably angrier than ever. It does cost a lot of blood tithe points this, so it would sap the ability to get other army wide buffs going early, which is kind of a trade off. But it certainly is really quite interesting and a big psychological blow to the opponents. Invest a load of resources in bringing down the enemy's scariest melee threat and all of a sudden it's back again and if you're lucky then they might even get the charge the next turn. 
He can return to the board really quite rapidly. If the enemy charges and kills him, then he could be back literally in the next movement phase for the World Eaters, so he's not off the board for long. And although the six blood tithe points does sound a bit steep, I'd bear in mind that when he dies, he will generate a couple of blood tithe points towards that score, one for a unit killed and one because the opponent will have killed a character in that phase. Interestingly, this is a mechanic that's going to be so much more powerful and kind of oppressive, I think, in smaller games. Army-wide buffs won't have quite as much value if you're only buffing, say, a thousand points worth of world eaters rather than 2k, and a lot of smaller armies might struggle to deal the damage they need to kill Angron in the first place, and having him just turn up again to wreck another one of their units is going to be kind of oppressive. Otherwise, though, he can make use of plenty of other blood tithe benefits. Broadly speaking, I feel like the melee damage ones are actually yet less useful for him, as he's quite likely to overkill quite a lot of targets, so probably the most value otherwise are the defensive boosts, the 6 plus feel no pain or make you around about 20% tougher, or the mortal wound one if you're expecting to run into a bunch of those. The other one that I think is really quite interesting is the 3 blood tithe point one for plus one to charges, that one synergizes very nicely with respawning him. It means that if you drop him 9 inches away, you only have an 8 inch charge, with a command point reroll that's going to succeed two thirds of the time, rather than just under half the time that it would be at 9 inches. A small extra chance to get Angron into close combat is going to be pretty big, with a crazy amount of damage that he can do. Otherwise, for the melee buffs, most are kind of underwhelming, even at best. Auto wounds aren't usually going to be a big deal for him, as he's got high strength anyway. Extra AP isn't so great, as he's already got good AP, and plus one to hit doesn't help when you're hitting on twos. If you want to make his combat better, then the one to go for is sixes to hit, get an extra hit. That one's five blood tithe points, usually that means a 20% damage buff, which is pretty mental given his already great damage. Overall, I feel like if Angron's in the army, maybe the ones to get going a little bit earlier than normal are the 6 plus feel no pain, the plus 1 to charges, the exploding 6s to hit, and of course thinking about respawning him when he dies if you want to. Otherwise, in terms of buffs and synergies, obviously he'll help out nearby units with his rerolls, that's going to be nice for units like 8 bound or terminators in particular, I guess. In terms of stratagems, I feel like the basic command reroll to reroll a failed charge is probably going to be one of the single best ways to actually help him out and get him more damage. If Angron's about to charge, I'd almost always want the command point available to do that. Otherwise, he could make use of skulls for the skull throne if he happens to manage to kill the enemy warlord. Not exactly guaranteed, but for 2 CP, you could have an extra 2 blood tithe points and a plus 1 to charge. Again, the plus 1 to charge could be very interesting with respawning him. Between that and the blood tithe, you could have him charging on a 7 inches, really quite likely to make it after he respawns. Not very reliable though, as you need to kill the enemy warlord, and they're not likely to want you to do that. Otherwise, the other interesting one is gory dismemberment. This one's one command point, and it means that 6 is to wound to deal one mortal wound to a maximum of 6. He can use it on core and characters, and he'd want to use this if he's using his big 39 attack sweep profile. With average dice, you've got a very good chance to max that out, and that might tip the balance against certain units that have got big inball saves, or things that negate one failed save or something like that. Mortal wounds might be more valuable there. If you use this, it would, say, make the sweep profile more efficient against units like Thunder Hammer Storm Shield Terminators. Finally, for synergies in the main codex, I'd bear in mind there's allied blood letters that might be able to help him out. That warp glocus keyword really is quite powerful, and with a 16 inch move, he's likely to be able to drop off scary corn melee units right close to the enemy. From turn 2 onwards, they can arrive from their demonic manifestation within 6 inches of him, and they only have to drop outside 6 inches of enemy units, basically guaranteeing them a very short charge. I guess the biggest downside of that might be if he just wants to go hurtling into combat, kill something and maybe get killed in return turn 1. It might make the rule just a little bit harder to trigger, unless you know you're playing on terrain with some really big line of sight blocking things, so you could keep him safe for a turn if there was nothing to charge. Finally, for support options, there's the Disciples of the Red Angel stratagems. That's the army of renown that Angron leads into battle that's all corn demons. He is necessary to run them in the first place but he can make use of a few of their World Eater stratagems, including one for ignoring charge modifiers, one for terrifying assault where the enemy can't overwatch, set to defend, and is minus one to hit in melee. Not bad if you're charging something scary, I guess. And there's one way you can give out a leadership debuff to nearby enemy units with minus two leadership and minus one combat attrition. I guess that could be okay in the right circumstance. I feel like the ignores charge modifiers is perhaps the most helpful out of those ones. Anything that removes barriers to him getting in combat is pretty nice. Could be good if he needs to charge something that has one of those or goes into difficult terrain. Otherwise, let's talk about his weaknesses and how I'd think about using Angron in-game then. 
I think while his strengths are obvious, mass amounts of melee damage, very fast, some fun command abilities, and stopping people falling back, he does have a few drawbacks. He can't hide well with his 18 wounds, and if the enemy's got loads of anti-tank weapons, that will be a problem for him. He hogs the Warlord trait slot, so it stops Lord Invercaftus getting you pre-game moves with other World Eaters units. He only has melee damage, which means that he can't deal multi-phase damage to damage cap models, and it does mean that if your opponent can negate his combat phases, in theory you might get a maximum of around about 5 dead enemy units per game if everything goes according to plan, never mind if he fails charges out of respawning, or if he can't get a good charge turn 1 for example. It's maybe one of the units where there's at least a little bit of scope for killing the rest of the models in the army, and just letting Angron do what he wants. Respawning him does have an opportunity cost, it means that you don't get the blood tithe upgrades going quite as quickly, and they are whole army buffs, and in terms of durability, he's just not all that tough, perhaps not for a model that's going to be thrown right at the front of the enemy army, and is likely going to be hit back very hard in return. Despite some downsides though, I still think he's overall strong, and here's how I think about using him in game for a world eater's army. When deploying, I think I'd usually want to try and set up behind a big terrain piece that can physically block line of sight if that exists on the table, though obviously it's perhaps not as big a deal if your opponent doesn't have some mass high strength anti-tank weapons to shoot him down with. If the enemy arm is primarily melee, then you may as well just set him up somewhere where he can be fairly aggressive and threaten enemy units right from the start of the game. Being a big chunk of points investments, you want him to get stuck in at least fairly early I think. Ideally he's going to be wanting to be fairly far forwards, and certainly within range of charging enemy units if they move on to objectives and things. Shouldn't be too hard to do with that enormous 16 inch movement. In terms of his 3 buffing abilities, I'd be tempted to use his champion ability on himself, unless he does just happen to have a really good target for that. If you think he's fairly likely to kill his target anyway, then 4 rerolls to hit would certainly help out a terminator, berserker or 8 bound unit just about to make a charge. Out of his 3 auras, as I mentioned, I think that the no fall back aura is by far the most powerful if it can be made relevant. You could probably just see from the enemy army, if you could kill one unit and then consolidate into another, then that's going to be really disruptive. It could really punish your opponent for putting two units too close together. In general though, I feel like it's probably just a little bit hard to coordinate with other World Eaters units. He moves ridiculously fast compared with anything else in the codex, and he generally needs to get stuck in early if you're going to get the value out of his big points cost. In terms of target choices, I think you generally just want to get him stuck into the biggest meatiest unit in the enemy army. I feel like he could make up a significant amount of his points cost in a single charge against the right targets. I'd say big tanks or elite infantry are generally pretty good ideas, but might just want to be a bit wary of anything that's just going to laugh off his damage and hit him back hard. Big blocks of Deathwing Terminators or characters with a damage cap are probably the things that you most want to avoid. You might just not get quite as big a return on your investment there. Usually the choice of the melee damage would be kind of obvious, usually against two wound or fewer infantry it's going to be the sweep attack, and more it's usually going to be the strike, but certain things like terminator squads typically might still favour the sweep as they still wound on twos, and it even might be a bit better against the getting around certain mechanics, say for example if the enemy chooses to command point reroll one, that's less effective against sweep attacks than the strikes. If you do think he's going to struggle to kill his target, you could always think about that sixes to wounds do your mortal wound stratagem, one command point often converted into 6 mortal wounds is rather good. Then if he can't lock anything in combat, or if he dies to a counter charge, you'd be thinking about respawning him. Sometimes I do think it might be a bit tricky to weigh that up against a whole army buff for the rest of your army, but I feel like if you are running him, it is going to happen at some point in the game. If possible, it would be nice to put him somewhere where he just isn't going to automatically die in return if he fails that 9 inch charge. He could put him somewhere quite disruptive that the enemy is going to struggle to reach, like right at the back of their army potentially, to try and menace their objective securing troops on home objectives. If they can fail to reach him to kill him back in return, his good movement should hopefully get the charge on something important. So overall, I do feel like Angron's really quite a cool and scary miniature for World Eaters in current 40k. He does seem really quite good value at 360 points for the melee damage he brings at that speed. I feel like one of the biggest selling points for him is that preventing fallback rule. It could be absolutely monstrous against a primarily shooting army, kill one thing and lock the next in combat as you consolidate into it, Angron's safe for the turn, you kill the enemy unit in their turn, and then you go on to charge something else and repeat the cycle of slaughter. I'd say his biggest issues are being shot down too early, or if he's respawning just sitting there and failing his charge and it happening again. But overall, I do feel like he's really quite a competitive pick, and is really going to hold back a World Eater's army. Whether or not he's actually auto include for them is maybe a bit more of a question though. I feel like in general, I would want to take Angron to lead the army in most circumstances. 
but I feel like in most circumstances, the main reason that you wouldn't want to run him in the army is if you wanted to take Lord Invocatus's Warlord trait with the ability to pre-game move a whole bunch of units. His rule is that himself and two core units get to make a pre-game movement, and that really is an enormous chunk of your army being thrown into the midfield and potentially getting first turn charges on the enemy themselves. I feel like for World Eater's list building, you're probably going to be choosing either that little formation, probably with the two big units of eight bound, or having Angron the Red Angel himself on the board, who he himself can quite likely threaten the first turn charge if the opponent doesn't deploy well far back, and that absolutely horrible ability to lock opponents in melee after he's killed one of them. Overall, despite any of his drawbacks, I do think that he's very, very usable, and I think the Games Workshop has probably got the balance right. Not 100% auto include, but not going to disappoint on the tabletop, the main reason being the option to respawn him, I think, which does kind of get around the whole issue of a big centerpiece model just being shot down dead, and it being a big loss to the army. Let me know what you think, though. I'll certainly be interested to hear your guys' takes. So anyway, hope you've enjoyed a bit of a rundown of how Angron the Red Angel functions in Warhammer 40k. Let me know your thoughts, or if you think I've missed anything else important, down in the comments. I'll certainly be looking forward to making a whole bunch of World Eaters unit reviews over the next few days. Hopefully the next video should be a full review of Codex World Eaters. I'll aim to have that out sometime within the next 24 hours, so feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics, or check back later if you'd like to see that. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that All Specs Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description below. The channel's Patreon is what allows me to keep on making videos like this quite so regularly. It does get you entry to things like the channel giveaways, like the Angron one for March, as an alternative way to the Facebook entry, but there are a fair few other things on it as well. You get to see certain videos early, there's regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and other things like getting your name in the credits, or a few other bits and bobs. Feel free to check out the Patreon page if you're interested, I'll link it down in the video description below. In any case, an absolutely enormous thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.